I'm very, I'm very challenged. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Mustafa, I don't think the rest of us, I, I, I don't know the rest, I'm pretty challenged. Anyway, I think now we can start. Now it's live. So, hello, namaste, and a warm welcome to Horace's Extraordinary Meeting 2020. First, I would like to thank all the esteemed panelists for finding time and joining us for this session, Leveraging Technology for Social Impact. I would also like to thank Dr. Frank and his team in Horasis for giving us this platform and giving us this topic, which is personally close to my heart. My name is Rohit Pujari. I am I'm a second time member of Legislative Assembly and Deputy Chief of Orissa Government. I represent a rural constituency in India, which is one of the most backward and underdeveloped constituency in the country. And it is way behind in all development parameters. And my most of my constituents are, are below poverty line of, of farmers and they depend on farming and forest produce for their livelihood. So why I'm talking about all this is I want to understand from each of the esteemed panelists that since we stay in a hyper-connected world with mobile phones, satellites, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud-based technologies and other new age technologies, how technology is not only impacting the world in general, but specifically rural constituencies like mine, the poor and the marginalized, farmer community and people at the bottom of the pyramid. And before I come to each of the panelists, I would like to introduce each one of you here. We have with us Gail Kristen Ganon, Managing Director of Wayward Capital USA and Founder CEO at Ensante, Mustafa Argan, Founder Embin, Jonah Donnell, Co-Founder Freedom Tech Ireland, Boston Thompson, Chair of Learning Through Play Lego Foundation, and Kristen Simmons, founder, Purpose Driven Innovation Japan. So without taking much time, I would like to understand from our first panelist, Gail Kristen Ganon, her take on leveraging technology for social impact. Over to you, Gail. Gail. Again, uh, am I audible? Okay. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead, Gail. It doesn't seem to work. Where are you located in Ireland? Okay, we are having some communication problem with Gail. Now, I think uh, we can move to our next panelist uh, till Gail gets a connection right. Uh, or should we wait for Gail for some more time? Gail, uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So she, she might she might have the audio settings of the computer uh, not uh, switched towards this uh, application actually. Uh, can we uh, do one thing? Can we move to the next panelist? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would now request Mustafa Argan, uh, founder Embin, to uh, give his uh, his take on leveraging technology for social impact. Mustafa, please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the nice introduction. I'm sorry to and, say uh, again. I'm the founder of the startup. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I'm the founder of a startup, you know, called Ambient, and we focus connectivity. And uh, overall, it's wonderful to be with you. And uh, we owe you gratitude to bring up this fantastic context. And Horace's meeting will uh, through the educational for me. So in order to conceptualize the post-COVID-19 world, I think we, we, 
we need to first uh, diagnose the roots of the COVID-19 problems, you know, pre-COVID-19 problems. You know, there was election in Trump, Trump's election in US, Brexit in, Brexit in UK, you know, yellow vested uprising in France, uh, separatist tendencies in uh, Europe, in Germany, Spain, Italy, in the politics of uh, those countries. And the present consensus in, in the Western media uh, tries to explain this via the political tension between the globalism driven by multinational companies versus local nationalism. This could be a poor explanation because the real reason seems to be the existing and potential unemployment problems due to the rapid advances in automation technologies as well as cloud technologies. You know, overall, globalism is a natural consequence of technological advances. And uh, reacting to apparent unemployment pro problem is caused by uh, typically capital mobility. You know, uh, mo capital is moving to far eastern countries. Today, even Mexico is looking for relatively cheap labor and in the form of offshoring, and they are closing down their national economies. This could let you know disastrous uh, consequences. And this situation is simply one step before the use of rot robotic automation technologies as well as cloud technologies in national economies. And hence, real problem is solving technological unemployment problem and without closing up national economies to international trade or co controlled capital mobility. So during the COVID-19 crisis, there are few technologies are uh, having a significant rise. You know, one of them is medical technologies of cure and prevention of such vaccination. And scientific basis for this is biology. Also remote enabling technologies in the areas of education and general productivity. And scientific basis for this applied electronic, the scientific basis for this is applied electronics and networking in telecom and digital computing. It is not unrealistic uh, to expect, you know, uh, eventually a remote laser precision optoelectronic technology for diagnosing the COVID-19 infection. This could be like a big breakthrough. But overall, uh, connectivity and robotic automation is uh, causing the uh, unemployment uh, and unbalancing the national economies with respect to each other. So overall, uh, you know, if, if I look at this in a bird's eye view, uh, there are technologies that achieve real social impact and uh, there is a never ending debate on this. Uh, a technology may impact one person group positively, another not so much. And uh, one could make the point that, you know, internet as a technology does have widespread positive social impact. And the impact of communication uh, is literally uh, flooding the world uh, in many aspects, but also uh, breaking the status quo uh, today with politics, uh, tomorrow with the life uh, in, in all around the world. So commun communication takes place in a small small amount of time and small area, but the, but what sets internet apart from any technology is you know it has a wide uh, area usage with positive impact to everyone in the world. So COVID nineteen make the uh, communication became the center stage to keep society and business going, and in our startup. Our main focus is to monitor and optimize the Wi-Fi performance at homes, at enterprises, at OTTs. So, because Wi-Fi became a business critical technology, everyone is, is connecting through the Wi-Fi, and uh, people are uh, sharing the homes with their children, with their wife, and everyone is connected uh, either with a collaboration technology or a streaming technology. They are consuming a lot of bandwidth. So this becomes a bad and leg, uh, and and this and people are thinking that you know startups like us is COVID uh, COVID positive startup, so uh, like Netflix as well as Zoom. So our focus uh, to this panel is coming from the the work we are doing in our startup in Ambient. We are also um, you know uh, advocating a social impact technology to uh, 
to cover the digital divide in the unconnected regions with uh, with smartphones. And this is a big race today. And it is another race of the telecom operators because they, it's a huge investment for them to put base stations, to put uh, fiber lines. And it becomes a race of the big internet players like Google, uh, Facebook, SpaceX, to tap the unconnected 4 billion people all in the world. And they want to reach the next billion to really append the entire uh, ecosystem. And imagine that, you know, the, if next billion of people are uh, connected by SpaceX, we will be using a SpaceX email, we will be using SpaceX chat, we will be using SpaceX Twitter. And that will, uh, that will have a disruption all around the world, and that will also free the communication and, uh, and away from the regulations of the national economies. And this is the, uh, maybe I will uh, talk later and I, I can sum up right now. And overall, we are looking at communication as a, uh, as a big uh, flattener uh, to make everyone in an equal situation to reach the to reach the information, as well as to bring their creativity on table wherever they are and whenever they are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mustafa. It was very enlightening. We'll come back to you more uh, uh, after some time for uh, to understand more on digital divide and digital literacy. Uh, now we'll move to our next panelist. Now uh, Gail is back with us. So uh, I would again... Uh, ask Gail to uh, to give her views on this on today's topic. <clears throat> we'll see. Can you hear me? Okay, or still cannot hear me? Yeah, uh, no, we hear you oh, loud and clear. Okay. Yes. Good morning and good evening, everyone. And so, my apologies, to Mustafa, if I'm going to repeat some of the, the t uh, main themes that you had mentioned earlier. Um, so, uh, with that said, uh, one of the uh, areas that I would say is most important, and I think you tapped on that, is how do we go about democratizing and really improving the social inequities that cut across all areas where the populations do not have access uh, to uh, mobility, they do not have access to means of, of, of continuous communication and connectivity. I think one of the main tenets, and, and we talk about this in terms of both social and, and health inequities, this very much cuts across all that. So to the extent that we can leverage um, the technology and enable solutions that will allow the mobilization and uh, network access as a utility, an utility that could be shared among all in an equitable way, I think that's one of the first and foremost um, ways to impact uh, people of all uh, places. And this is not only just during COVID, but also COVID, as we would call, is, I would say, the exacerbator or perhaps the leveling and, and really shows the cracks and the kinks in the social systems and, and more than anything else has um, sh shined a huge harsh light on, on all ecosystems that ostensibly were to serve a larger broad-based population, and now it has failed to do so. And, and so with that said, I'm, um, I would ask and, and challenge all those who are participating in this International Congress to think about the kinds of social policies that will allow people to play, to play equitably in, the, in a field they wouldn't otherwise. And what does that consist of? I think it consists, as I mentioned earlier, um, having um, free and, and able access to mobility and technologies to, uh, to actually provide um, free and, and um, of communication at all times. In addition to that, what that does is it, it frees up and allows people to uh, have access to educational opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. And then secondly, that to education then also moves to uh, the greater paradigm which has to talk about how do you um, elevate, elevate the people who now have found an opportunity to take their creativity and to give them visibility. And so with that, I'm going to pass the torch. Uh, thank you, Gail, for it was very informative and enlightening. So uh, now uh, we'll come back to you again, Gail. But now I would ask our third panelist for, the, uh, for today's session, Joanna Donnell. 
co-founder Freedom Tech, uh, to give her views. Um, good morning, Rohit, and um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, so greetings to everybody from Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm here to speak about something that's very dear to my heart, but also that um, is part of the chain of um, supply that um, previous speakers have spoken to. So I want to speak about um, assistive and accessible technology. Um, and, as, uh, and what we're talking about here is something that is as fundamental to our needs today as electricity was um, almost 100 years ago. And I would say that um, innovators are, are very stifled as the title for this um, talk sets out. Um, but it's an issue that we all have a stake in and a collective responsibility to come together and um, work more coherently about. Because when I'm talking about um, accessible and assistive technology, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, the high-end stakes of AI, BCIs, wearables, etc. even though they are part of the mix. I'm talking about access to basic communication. I'm talking to access to um, apps, smartphones, wayfinding apps so you can get from A to B, software so you can use a laptop if you can't see so that you can work, smart home technology so that you can actually continue to live in your own home. So these are all things that, that, that we would expect to have access to especially in an age when technology has actually advanced um, so so far. And yet globally, um, the World Health Organization reminds us that um, a billion people who need these assistive technologies and services <clears throat> today. And those dates, pre those figures um, predate COVID. And the expectation was that that figure would double over 10 years. So we can only imagine how the need to stay connected, the need to get um, access to more, um, sorry, um, to, the, 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 to stay in contact, to be able to work from home and remotely and so on. That need is only accelerating. Um, so we really have something that we really need to address here. Um, and yet very few countries have got national policies that actually provide <coughs> assistive and accessible technology to people with disabilities, older people, and now increasingly people with chronic conditions post-COVID. And where they do have those national policies, they stand alone and they turn to be not integrated. We have Freedom Tech um, developed an idea called the AT Passport, okay? And it's a very, very simple idea. It's about creating a joined up system and putting the user of technology in control of their own data as well as the technology that they would use. So it's a simple electronic record of user needs and it needs an ecosystem to go around it. So that would mean that it would need both the social policy, the procurement elements, as well as service delivery across all the areas that people's lives go to. And that it doesn't continue to get siloed into um, government department functions. So people need to be able to take their technology from school to college. And, and that's something that's all on all our minds at this time of year. Um, students going to college having left school are doubly disadvantaged. Not only are they sitting at home in most countries now trying to learn, but they don't have access to the technology that will help them to, um, to actually get on, learn and engage with other students. So we're an NGO-led initiative. We, the concept of the AT Passport has got, gained great traction at WHO level. Um, we have great support from academia and um, the All Institute, with which I'm connected with in Maynooth in a university in Ireland, is very much behind this concept. We also have the support of major tech companies. So what we're missing, really, for a, an effective quadruple helix um, collaboration is, is governments and governments to get more involved. OK, and the, the, I think some of the issues are that governments and the way that, that, that things are structured don't really um, reward cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, cross-departmental working. Um, and there's something about us being able to develop more um, systemic um, capabilities um, to develop our collective sense-making and also 
even though we're at a time when we need to accelerate at great speed, we also need to develop our reflexive practice across all the different levels of the system. So not just at a policy level, but also we need to engage in continuous learning and, and shared learning um, through things like communities of practice, which Freedom Tech has here in Ireland, um, to, to move the situation forward. Um, and I think that is the only way that we can actually begin to look at the SDGs in really useful ways. Um, and I'll come back to this later, but I think that one of the things that it needs to needs to happen is, is that we all need to remember that even though we've fallen in love with technology in some way, we're all finite embodied beings and we need to learn and, and perhaps play um, from that place in order to shift our thinking on this. So thank you and I'll pass the bat on them. Thank you, John, for that uh, great insight on assistive technologies and the policy uh, needed from the government, uh, the challenges for it. So uh, now we'll uh, move to our next uh, esteemed panelist, Boston Thompson, Chair of Learning Through Play Lego Foundation. Please go ahead, Bo. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Early morning in Denmark. Um, Technologies can uh, definitely be used for social impact. And the most important place for social impact right now is in education. So we have 100 millions of children who are outside school right now and who don't have basic access to uh, knowledge, any infrastructures and so forth. So, so for us uh, in the Lego Foundation where we focus on creativity and play and learning, the main starting point is that technology can enable children to have not only knowledge, but a much broader set of skills that are needed, uh, particularly right now. So technology is about access. I think we heard that. It's also about data infrastructures, uh, and that's really, really important. But it's also about how technologies are used. And I think Joan spoke a little bit to some of that in terms of choices, being able to collectively exchange, have control over your own devices and so forth, but and data. But but what we've seen most important now in, we work in more than 30 countries and a big study right now in South Africa and, 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 and Europe indicates that children and young people are actually using technology in very creative ways already now. They're not using it to download and stream. They actually use it to create things. They use it to play music. They are, they are drawing and documenting. So technologies are completely integrated with their ways of learning. And what we should kind of role model is these new ways of using technologies, which is not old ways of thinking about education that transfer information, but enable creative use of technologies where you can create content, where you have choices, and where you can collaborate with others. So our agenda and what we've seen is, you know, promote much more creative and playful use of technologies where children and young people not only knows about the new sophisticated ways of thinking about technologies like AI and new systems, but more thinking about the ways where they can be more social, they can be more creative, and where it's uh, it's possible to diversify the use of technologies. Right now, many types of technologies and software is only generalized for a majority, uh, uh, a small part of the population. We need technologies to be much more about particular diversity in context, in geography, in language, in ethnicity, in gender. And uh, there's such a massive opportunity to think about technologies for skills development and for, for use across education. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Uh, we'll come back to you for more on children education later uh, and how technology is impacting education. Uh, Along with that, uh, now we will uh, go move to our, the, our last speaker, but not the least, uh, Kristen Simmet uh, from Purpose Driven Innovation Japan. Over to you, Kristen. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Japan. It's very, it's an honor to be included in this very interesting panel. Uh, so I'm, I'm the founder of the Purpose Driven Innovation Ecosystem, actually. So the E stands for ecosystem. And so we're building a global ecosystem uh, and we're looking into how can technology and innovation help uh, for, for sustainable uh, impact. And um, we are currently, I mean, I have started this last year. 
we're focusing on uh, renewable energy, uh, circular economy, and corporate transformation. So we, we define the different stakeholders of society. Uh, we have uh, the corporates, the startups, uh, R&D, and investors, the capital side, and try to connect uh, the different dots and um, screening. Uh, I'm, I'm in Tokyo, in Japan, so it, this is a, a nation which is very advanced uh, already in technology and which also can take responsibility. Um, in, in the purpose-driven innovation ecosystem, we come across many interesting uh, things and we collaborate uh, with a lot of uh, international organizations, for example, like Seedstars. Uh, they are focusing on emerging markets and uh, I'm also operationally active in the rice exchange and this is uh, what you mentioned. Uh, the, it's about agriculture, it's about uh, creating a global trading platform for rice and uh, we just talk about uh, collaboration with an area in India called Andhra Pradesh and they have the uh, zero budget uh, farming initiative which is also supported by the United Nations Development Organization and um, we work together with uh, another company called Producers Market. Our, ours is Rice Exchange. We do the international rice trade. So we, if they can create uh, the certificates and uh, the methodology for uh, making this um, sustainable and organic rice without any chemical inputs, uh, we can help them to market this for international markets. There's a farmer community of uh, I think 13,000 farmers, uh, if I get it right. And it's, it's a vast area. And by um, eliminating the input cost and shifting to organic, first of all, you, you create uh, opportunities and um, you also leverage uh, the income uh, of these uh, farmer communities. And uh, by creating the, the certifications, which can be um, enabled by blockchain technology, uh, we, we can uh, get this certification and bring this to the international trade. So this, this is something which we are looking into uh, to be launched uh, uh, soon. And this is, of course, only one, one example. Uh, there is um, is a very interesting renewable energy technology which is uh, developed in Germany right now. Uh, it's it's a nano paste. It's a biodegradable with uh, conventional uh, solar panels. Uh, we have uh, the problem of toxic waste after the life cycle ends, and with a nano paste because it's biodegradable and it can fulfill uh, different functions and it's cheap to produce, uh, it, it would be a, a great opportunity to also bring this uh, into these emerging markets. Um, and, you know, with, with the purpose-driven innovation ecosystem, uh, we, we have the three pillars, PDIE Institute, uh, educate and inspire, create the awareness. And then we have the execution part where, where we put the awareness into action. So what we were talking about before, the, the education is, of course, a base level for anything uh, to enable uh, social change. And, yeah, that's, that's, that's something uh, uh, we are also working on in, in different initiatives. I keep it uh, with this for the time being. And, uh, yeah, thanks uh, for okay. having me. Thanks, Christian. Uh, now I'll uh, continue with Christian only. Uh, I would like to understand uh, social. How do you define social impact? And uh, these uh, and these terminologies have different perceptions. How will you define it? And also, if you can uh, tell me how your rice exchange will uh, will influence will have impact on small and marginal farmers. Great, great question. 
So yeah, I, I think that any kind of discussion, uh, we we have to uh, get a common understanding about the definition of uh, the terminology. And uh, first of all, I, uh, when I hear social impact or social entrepreneur, uh, it is all it is very often a mix uh, of the social aspect and also the environmental aspect. So um, with For example, um, with the environmental aspect, uh, we are also working on a platform called We Mori uh, for the for saving forests around the world, uh, creating an app to give power to the millennial generation so that they can donate uh, for forest projects and have transparency about this. How do we uh, create this? Or what is my understanding about social impact is purely the, the social as aspect and not the environmental aspect. But, of course, it can be interconnected because if we solve the social aspect, like uh, starting from education uh, to uh, lifting out these smallholder farmers out of poverty, um, we can, it can have, have an impact also internationally because uh, out of these things we have the refugee crisis, uh, people, uh, so many people coming into Europe. <clears throat> And um, yeah, with, with the rice exchange, <clears throat> how do we solve this? We work with uh, uh, SRP, the Sustainable Rice Platform, which is convened by the United Nations. <clears throat> And they uh, prescribe a kind of uh, a management system, uh, including water management, uh, input of chemicals, so reducing the input. And uh, this has an, a positive impact also on uh, the uh, methane emissions. So it, it reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the income of the farmers who apply these uh, methodologies uh, is increasing because uh, in, the developing, uh, in the developed OECD countries where the rice is exported to, Uh, there is a, an increased awareness for organic or fair trade uh, rice, which can achieve higher pricing. So by by having the um, having this implemented at the local level, at the farmer level, uh, together with the SRP, the Sustainable Rice Platform, uh, we we can help to uh, get farmers out of of poverty. Also, finally, by eliminating all these different steps in the in the uh, distribution. But we actually, with the rice exchange, we don't say that we want to eliminate, uh, we don't want to cut the middleman or something like this, but this is something which will automatically uh, emerge out of this. So that, that's, uh, in a nutshell, what, what we are doing. Thank you, Christian. That was very informative. Uh, now, I would like to understand from Bo, Uh, since uh, uh, Bo is like uh, children and education is very close to his heart, I would like to understand uh, how play and creativity an important part of technology for learning and education and what new ways are technologies used for education during this pandemic? Thank you very much. Um, I'll make it short. So, so first, uh, we argue for a much more optimistic and creative use of technology. I think there's a lot of discussion in which way we should restrict and, and control and, and uh, you know, limit our opportunities for technologies, which is quite important to be mindful about data and other things. But the best way to learn about technology is to creatively try and test out things with it. And uh, that is really about play, being actively engaged, figuring out, innovating with technologies. And there are three ways that that really happens right now in education. First, blended forms of learning where children and young people and even adults switch between a workplace or a school and a home environment. Technologies that cuts across these environments have huge opportunities to increase uh, access and quality of education. And we see that right now in increased independence and increased choice and increased initiative among individuals. Secondly, there's a much broader role of skills development right now. So technology is not used only to transfer knowledge, but being able to test and try out things and teachers being coaches Uh, 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 managers being coaches to their employees also, and much more agency in the use of these. And finally, there's a lot of alternative forms of assessments, adaptive and personalized forms of learning. Uh, 
So the new technology really allows you to document, uh, monitor, get feedback, develop your own assessments, personalize uh, and customize things. So, so that's how the three ways we see that with the mindset of playing and creativity, you actually enable a new form of technology with a lot of other types of products, a lot of types of software and new types of skills, which cuts across traditional ways of thinking about education. Thank you, Bo. Now, all our children are dependent on digital education now within this COVID times. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for all the inputs. And now I would like to understand from Joan, who, uh, who has, who's doing great work in assistive and assist, accessible technologies. Uh, uh, the, I would like to understand yeah. how stakeholders develop system, systemic capabilities to work more closely together to deliver social impact. And can you tell us more about what collective sense making might look like in practice? Um, thanks. Um, just listening to Bo, I'm really struck by um, how exciting it would be if our policymakers um, learned to play um, and if we could develop those kind of transdisciplinary conversations that, um, that can use a new language um, because very often we don't understand each other across different industries and, and different developments and so on. And one thing that we have seen since COVID is huge ingenuity um, coming up in terms of how services have gone online, not just education services, but how people with disabilities and older people are being supported whilst they can access um, work or services that they otherwise need. And there's a divide here between those who are really well able to adapt and, um, and, and learn on the hoof, literally, as we're all doing in this, in this new world. And the, the, those who are being left behind here. So there's the need for collected sense making and embodied sense making, I think is huge. Um, and, and it goes beyond policymakers. It has to happen at all fractal levels of the system. Um, organizationally, even we are closed cognitive systems. And I think play and engagement of that sort helps to, to, um, disrupt our own tendencies to, um, stay, stay within what we know. We need to move beyond that knowledge transfer um, kind of thinking. Um, so, so technology really helps with that, um, ironically, um, and, and can help us to get back in touch with more of the kind, creating some of the kind of social impact that we need to see it have. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but the start, I hope, of a very exciting conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, now, uh, I would like to understand from uh, Mustafa, uh, since he understands mobile networks and connectivity so well, and he gave his views also. But I would like to understand uh, uh, digital divide in constituencies like mine. Uh, still, uh, uh, digital divide is a big challenge. Uh, internet connectivity is a big challenge. Uh, and uh, along with that, digital literacy and training is also a big challenge. So I would like to understand more from you, Mustafa. Mustafa, uh, you, are, you have to unmute yourself. You need to unmute. <coughs> Mustafa, am I audible? You have to unmute yourself. There's something wrong. He's not unmuting himself. Anyway. Uh, I'm not able to hear you. Yeah. I'll now um, uh, move to Gail. Gail, can you just tell me, uh, given the digital divide that has suffered accelerated by COVID-19, what should, solutions should be created to help democratize access to social enabling technology? And how to address such social inequities? 
Sure. Uh, so to speaking to that earlier, as I mentioned, one of the things that is, is really pointed is the, the underlying or the foundations of communications and how do you, as I mentioned earlier, was how do you democratize that and how do you bring that to the foray? So one of the things that I would like to see is really this, this whole idea of having broadband as a utility and mobility connected to them. But in addition to that, something to Paul's point, which is, uh, we haven't thought about is the intergenerational gaps that happen. So it's not just the digital divides of rural and metropolitan, but also the, the intergenerational age gaps. And how do you integrate play? Play as an opportunity for people to learn, learn in a way that they would not typically have learned and, and to close that digital divide by integrating that aspect. We haven't explored that in many places because often, uh, interesting enough, but because of the way our our nations organize, we often build things in silos. And so breaking down those silos where there's a, a cross sort of cross industry um, in terms of both play as well as technology. I, I think, uh, we, are, we, are, we have hardly any time left. Oh, uh, thank okay. you everyone for joining. And it was a very insightful. <laughs> thank you. For Thank the, you. For joining, and it was nice talking to all of you. Thank you. Start caution. Bye. 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 I think it's over. Thank you again, and we'll stay in touch, hopefully. And uh, uh, given a chance, I invite all of you to India, and you know, you can always. Visit uh, in, in uh, us in India, and I'm there. To uh, if you want, you can come and visit my constituency also. Okay. I'm in the eastern part of India. Uh, in Singapore. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you oh, so much. Oh, okay, so we... Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone else. <laughs> bye, bye.